Hey YouTube, Joe Boy here. So, yeah, that's right, guys. You're seeing this right. We're talking about Berserk. So, before we get into the video itself, I want to explain what this video is about. I am not caught up to Berserk. I'm not even close to being caught up to Berserk. Many of you out there might be watching Totally Not Mark's uh, blind reviews of One Piece arcs as he catches up to the series. That's sort of an inspiration for this, except for I've already read through One Piece, so this is about Berserk. An additional caveat is this is not 100% blind, although it will be eventually. I've watched the original Berserk anime, I've also watched the recent adaptations, so I'm familiar with the story up through the Golden Era, or the Golden Age, which is essentially the first hundred or so chapters of Berserk. So with this in mind, this video which is going to cover the Black Swordsman arc, and the next video which is going to cover the Golden Era arc are not fully blind. After this, it will be. I will read the art, and then I'll make the review, and I will continue forward such as that. I understand that a lot of people are going to respond to this video with comments such as, bro, this isn't about One Piece. If you do not, have not read Berserk, you can still watch this video. It's made in such a way that it can still be enjoyable, even if you don't watch it. Although, ideally, this is made for people who have already read what I'm going to be talking about, and or read it with me. And so in that way, you can share your thoughts about these arcs or the story at the same time. For years, people have told me to read and watch Berserk from, you know, the first moments that I really got into anime and manga. But over 15 years, I still haven't caught up and I really want to. So I thought it'd be fun to catch up with you guys and talk about my thoughts along the way. At the very least, I want to fully understand what all the hype and excitement is about, not only for the things that I've already seen, which I know are good, but the things that come after. But yeah, guys, this is our starting point. Let's talk about Berserk. So I want to set the stage for this conversation about Berserk before we talk about specifics, because to talk about Berserk is also to talk about a moment in history those who are younger would not appreciate. I think it adds good context to why Berserk is so beloved. Nowadays, violent, mature manga and anime are commonplace and mainstream, like Death Note, Attack on Titan, Tokyo Ghoul, Game of Thrones, First Law, etc. But believe me when I say that this was not always so common. I think to understand this best, simply talk to your parents. The kinds of things that were okay to watch or read or listen to when they were growing up was very different to today. You know, family friendly is a buzzword. For me, this is the honest truth. Manga and anime is popular today outside of Japan, at least in part, because manga and anime went darker faster. In the 70s, there was a great boom in the horror genre, which was often censored yet still widely popular. Over the late 70s and 80s, this movement crossed over into fantasy and manga as people sought out dark, graphic, yet realistic and heroic stories. Either for the shock and awe of how different it was to what was accepted and commonly pushed, subversion of the tropes and themes that had lost their luster through overuse, or the philosophical or moral questions that could be posed from a story told in this way. I think that the balance that manga found that made it so appealing and told stories that we're so widely interested in is the combination of new epic coming of age or hero's journey type stories explored with great mastery in many new ways presented in a medium that was easily consumed and from this birthed epic yet realistic fantasy based on a mythology and culture that the west at least was not familiar with these kinds of stories were taboo because it was believed that storytellers had a responsibility to teach moral and ethical righteousness, and frankly, the graphic nature of the genre had many people offended. Even to this day, reading Berserk, many people would be offended. Graphic nudity, mature themes, horrific levels of violence. Now guys, certainly reality is more often than not far from ideal, but the responsibility we all have is to strive for and teach that ideal even as it is difficult, so as to not unintentionally absolve yourself or the people that are reading your stories of the same responsibility. The idea is essentially, this is depicting what is real and common. Therefore, I can believe that I do not need to hold myself to this unrealistic high standard that is being preached around me. And as a society, I think fear grew that we would all slowly start to fall into depravity by reading stories such as this. It was interpreted that stories such as Berserk taught values that could be dangerous and lead to an acceptance of violence. It's an interesting conversation. I'm not standing for or against this take, but this is why stories like Berserk in this movement at the time was so controversial. 
It actually makes far more sense for a country like Japan to embrace and create these kinds of stories more easily because of the horror aspects of their culture relating to Shinto tradition and religion. Read yourself some yokai stories, not what you would typically say is for children. And I find these elements are often lost or covered up in Western religions despite being there. But as is human nature, we don't react well when we're told what to do. The counterculture won, and it did so in part because of masterful stories such as Berserk, which actually predates the majority of what you might want to call its contemporaries. Berserk at its most essential is a dark horror epic fantasy. Berserk began in 1989, another monolith of the genre that came to define it, define a culture, Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones was released in 1996, seven years later. Berserk was definitely at the forefront of a huge shift in culture around the world. I find it interesting that the first arc of Berserk probably isn't the one that really sells it the best. But in retrospect, I think that it is an incredibly effective initiation into the world of Berserk. The Black Swordsman arc, the very first arc, is suffering. That is somehow also pleasurable in its depressing description of a very unkind reality. Mind you, this comes from somebody who isn't the biggest fan of horror. I'm the, you know, happy-go-lucky, shonen type of reader. I typically want tears of joy in equal measure to tears of despair. This first arc is all about can you handle Berserk at its darkest? And if you can't, you will be weeded out very quickly. I shit you not, open volume one and the very first scene in all of Berserk, the protagonist is getting comfortable, you know, comfortable with a woman who midway becomes a mini appendage demon. Yeah, reverse tentacle porn. But as I said, guys, I found this effective. There are no false promises when you first pick up Berserk. You won't be shocked later and drop it. Muir makes it very clear the world that you are stepping into. It is not pretty. The arc paints a dramatically cynical world to the point that it can be painful. And that's the point. Great stories cultivate emotion. But not only motion is positive, Berserk makes you feel some things you would rather not. So this first arc essentially splits into three short stories covering about three volumes. The first tells the story of the Snake Lord. Enter our protagonist guts within this pseudo-European medieval world. There are many things which have come to define a hero of epic stories, but traditionally they are depicted as the optimist, those who confront that which is rotten and wish to change it for the better. They are motivated to save the world for whatever personal or grand reason. Guts is really nothing like this. Not yet. I don't believe that Guts is trying to save the world. Or meaningfully change it for the better. This world is certainly rotten. We enter the story and are immediately confronted with immoral soldiers who are entertained in the sport of torturing an innocent yet talkative elf, Puck. The people of this world seem to generally understand right from wrong, as these soldiers throw knives at Puck, Muir depicts the citizens' discomfort. The elf should not be treated this way. But to fight for the elf is to also put yourself at risk. The soldiers could then attack you, or you can make enemies of whoever their lord is. So the citizens do nothing. In this case, might is right. Power determines what you can accomplish. The philosophy of Berserk, I think, is this. People are selfish and fearful. Only those with power and determination can walk a path of their own choosing. Moral right and wrong takes a backseat to what is best for you when you don't have some kind of greater conviction or ambition other than self-preservation. People often choose the path of immediate safety, regardless of the possible long-term consequences or the effect ignoring present atrocities can have on your soul. Much is justified because of fear. Puck, this innocent elf, may need to be saved, but I can't save him, so I won't try to. And it wouldn't matter anyway, because even if I tried, I would fail, and then I would just die with him. The people of this town are coward, and thus do nothing but attempt to quietly exist as evil permeates around them. Generally speaking, the only ones who get a say are those with power, and if you do not have power and attempt to walk your own path, you will die. And as we learn shortly after, it isn't just the common folk. Their leaders are equally subdued, and even our main character. This is where we get introduced to the mayor and the snake lord. Rereading the story, it invites the question, is it moral to make half measures out of fear, when doing what is right will certainly mean death? 
Can one be moral without hope? The Snake Lord, who is the ultimate power in this region, is a monster, a demon, who consumes human flesh and who takes human form. The mayor knows this, even as some of his subjects do not. He believes this creature is unkillable. To confront it, I think it's implied, he believes is to die. Not only himself, but his entire town will perish in the attempt. He does not have hope of anything better than to coexist with this creature, and to this end he made a deal. He willingly provides innocent people, women and children, for the monster to eat, with the expectation that in doing so, he and the majority of the town continue to survive. Guts confronts him about his deal, and he tells Guts, you don't understand. It is my duty to protect this town. And I think that this is what he was referring to, as he saw it. This was a predicament where no path led to winning, only somewhat surviving. He does what he needs to, what he feels like is necessary, in order for his town to continue surviving. But Guts poses the question, are you saving the town, or are you just saving yourself? In this half measure, he has chosen not only the solution of best survival of his people, but of himself. In fact, dutiful as he is to the whims of the Snake Lord, he is perhaps most safe out of all of the people. Or so he thinks. In my opinion, guys, the mayor likely lives within his own comfortable delusion. He falsely justifies himself that what he is doing is right for the betterment of all he is saving people and that his life is necessary for others. This is his lie to himself. As Guts confronts him with the truth, he clutches at his heart because he knows it to be true, but he cannot accept it without destroying himself. He didn't do it for the people. He did it for himself. As we like to paint Evil generally as the Dark Overlord, obvious to all that it is there, the example of the mayor is also a kind of evil, human nature of self-preservation at the expense of others, justified in whatever way to absolve themselves of moral or ethical responsibility. The Evil Overlord, the Snake Lords, may be a thing more common to stories than real life, but mayors are present all around you, self-important entitled, fearful, ignorant enough to be manipulated, cunning enough to be able to craft lies for themselves, lacking introspection and honesty enough to seek the truth at the expense of themselves. The simple truth here is that the mayor cared far less about saving the town as he cared for saving himself. All of these other reasons create a false justification for which he can be comfortable within this lie, so that he can believe in it. At least for myself, and I assume many others, this concept demonstrated here is the appeal of the grim dark fantasy. Exploration of philosophy often ignored on purpose because it is uncomfortable. If you think too much about this, you will find yourself in the mayor, in whatever specific way, myself included. The Snake Lord is the trope, indefensible, clear evil that must be eradicated. But it is also an evil that does not exist, usually, because in all acts of evil, man justifies himself, such as that he is the hero of his own contrived story. We will go to great lengths to find self-significance, even if it requires us to ambiguate virtue. The evil overlord who seeks death and suffering for the sake of death and suffering is embellished evil. Whatever nuance that exists in reality is lost. Reality itself is lost. Even Hitler thought that he was saving the world. In a way, this trope of the evil overlord acts to further deceive ourselves of the truth. It's a self-imposed, comfortable delusion. Evil, of course, is always apparent, such that I would immediately recognize it because I am better than that. In most cases, I think we are not. But just like Berserk, I tend to be more cynical than not, which is probably a big reason why I enjoy Berserk where maybe other people wouldn't. Evil actions in this world, just the same as the world in Berserk, are made by people often very similar to yourself, just with power in whatever form or context with the ambition and conviction to act upon their delusions. And just frankly, not all delusion is so apparent that you would be able to notice it. Because to assume that you are deluded means that you do not know the truth, and the truth is not always easily discovered. I believe that stories told in this way have an element of philosophical discovery or perhaps vindicate your own discovery about the nature of man through this shared perspective with the author. Is it pessimistic? Of course it is. 
But not everybody fears an understanding of uncomfortable truths and tough questions. Either way, I find the conversation fascinating. But even still, I think that there is a discussion here that is worthy of contemplation. The mayor believes that he is saving this town, even at the expense of some innocent. And that is still true, even if his motivation is more selfish than he is wont to admit. There is some potential good here. So what did he do wrong? What is right in this case? What should we strive for in a situation such as this? Should he have fought and accepted inevitable death when it was obvious that that would be the outcome? Should he have first sacrificed himself rather than the innocent and would that make this okay? Essentially proving here that he did value the town and the people's lives more than his own. And he simply thought that this was the right decision to make. Right, it is possible that the mayor is the right person or the only person capable of leading his people forward past this misfortune. I think it's a decision leaders must face. In what way can I save my people? Which path best guides this? And unfortunately, in reality, sometimes it depends on the situation, but sometimes sacrifices may be necessary. Even in our society, think of somebody like soldiers or police officers or firefighters. Their job accepts the risk of their own possible death. If they were to die on the job, their death would be for the people. Although it isn't guaranteed death, they are essentially sacrifices for the betterment of everybody else. Ideally, of course, if they're fighting for the right things. This is something often not easily known for sure. Sometimes all we are left with is belief and faith in others or in ourselves. I think that the moral here is simply that the mayor should have never lost hope for a better solution. He should have never gave in to his fear. And in this story, Guts plays a pivotal role. Guts is this town's salvation, the one who is capable of doing the impossible and defeating this monster. He arrives and demonstrates his strength and skill. Guts presents an opportunity. The mayor rejects his salvation because of his fear. He does not even give Guts the opportunity to fight. Due to the threat Guts' potential failure could have for the mayor himself, the mayor captures him, tortures him, and attempts to present him to the Snake Lord as an offering of peace. There were many things that were possible in this moment. Hope presented itself, and the mayor chose to abandon it. Even if everything up to this point could be morally justified, the mayor here shows his true colors. More than his desire to do good is his desire for life. If this is all you are, you are at the whim of whatever force happens to control you, whether it be good or evil. You then become nothing more than a product of that. In a way, you become that. Your environment transforms you if your ambition is so small. In a peaceful society, you too may be peaceful and virtuous. But when that peace is lost and your strength is needed more than ever, those ethics are sacrificed for your own survival. This is just something to think about. I'm keeping this vague for a reason. It applies to a lot of different circumstances. The irony here for the mayor is that he believed by fighting for the Snake Lord's dominion that he would be safe from his wrath. But to the Snake Lord, it was always just a fun game where none of the pieces mattered except for himself too. But I would say the general message of all stories like this, even dark ones such as Berserk, is there is always a better way. Even if that may not be true, you should always seek it. You can never lose hope. You would think that this perfectly sets up the introduction of our powerful, renowned hero, honor bound to save the innocent. He's destroying the evils of this world because of his moral enlightenment and his vision of something better. And I mean, yeah, sure, you know, Guts killed those thugs from the inn in the beginning, but was it to save Puck? Absolutely not. That was just a coincidence. He just wanted to get his enemy's attention. The same is true of his defeat of the Snake Lord. Did he do that for anybody other than himself for some kind of greater good? No. Guts is a force which destroys evil, but not for the sake of heroism. He doesn't seem to believe in heroism. He simply understands that the weak are used and then die, while the strong use others and survive. Guts believes only in power and determination, and those with this clear the paths that others get to travel, for better or for worse. So Guts does what Guts does. He encounters the monster and he defeats it, 
often through sheer willpower. No matter how much damage he takes, what injuries he suffers, he stands back up. I think in this, Guts represents the potential of human nature. Just as we said before, never lose hope, never give up. Once you do, you become a part of the evil or whatever your environment may be. Guts demonstrates that anything is possible, even a human killing an unkillable monster. But I've gotta admit guys, as Guts is in this first arc, he is somewhat insufferable. He's obviously competent, very cool, and I respect and admire that. You know, for example, Berserk may have created the trope, or at least popularized it, the idea of the swordsman with the big ass sword. But competency, coolness, and power I find are hollow things without people to fight for, without friends. I want it understood, as it has been explained to me, Guts doesn't stay this way. This is just his starting point, from which I assume Yura will slowly humanize him. But it is a rough start. For me, Guts at this time is not likable, and I understand that that is intentional, but it doesn't take away my feeling. Again, as we were talking about hope being a huge component of morality, doing what is right, and avoiding a path of evil, Guts is struggling with this hope himself. It's a very clear theme. I think that Miura's inclusion of Puck was absolutely necessary in order to guide him. As we discussed earlier, Puck the Elf was being tortured, tied up with knives thrown at him. Guts saves him by coincidence, and then Puck takes an interest in him and follows him for the rest of the arc. I think that Guts makes for a pretty poor protagonist by himself. To defeat evil without compassion is not as compelling, and Mir uses Puck to kind of counterbalance this. Puck is Guts' conscience, physically manifest, and his presence exists to continually establish that Guts needs to grow as a character. I do not think Berserk works without Puck. And although I am not at that part in the story yet, I would wager Puck plays a significant role transforming him. At the same time, I feel as though Puck is Miura's voice, commenting on the world and guts, often deplorable actions as the protagonist, letting us know that Miura is not a despicable fatalist who simply enjoys depravity. When your hero cannot be your moral compass, you may need another, and in Berserk, I believe this to be Puck. Puck then is a reminder that although the world is dark, and themes are explored through this lens, Berserk does intend to preach morality. I think that thinking about Puck as a character and his ambition is pretty interesting. At this point, we don't know exactly what it is that he wants. It's not outright stated, but I do wonder whether Puck wishes to save the world, or at least is carried forward by his strong moral direction. In this way, he could see Guts as a force with the power to accomplish this, someone who also needs guidance, Someone who also needs to be saved. No matter how many times Guts refuses the elf's company, Puck returns. Perhaps it is in part totally random chaotic fate, which is also an element of Berserk, so this might be the case, but I can't help but to feel that Puck has lofty ambitions of his own, just lacking the power to accomplish them by himself. He sees Guts' potential. Saving Guts is not only what is right, it is likely an act of great consequence for the world as a whole. But as I said, the arc is divided into several short stories. The Snake Lord was the first, the next follows slightly different themes, all the while continuing to explore the characters, their circumstances, the world around them, and its supernatural aspects. I think that these first chapters do a pretty good job of explaining Guts as he is in this moment, who he is, what he stands for. There is no apparent lofty ambition aside from destroying evil. Guts is only motivated by revenge. I said that he was an insufferable protagonist at this time, and true as that might be, this is explained and rationalized, and I think a very clever and satisfying way. Guts is constantly being pursued by demons, because a mark or brand on his neck calls them. Therefore, anybody who associates with him would be in danger. Guts is a loner who does not attempt to fight for compassion, because clearly doing so has burned him in some way. He is in fact attempting to save people by spurning them. He is better off without them and they are better off without him. I would say that it's not really his fault, that at this time he has no and seems to want no meaningful relationships. But Guts sits on some kind of awkward precipice between moral responsibility and indifference. On one hand he cares, on the other hand he has stopped caring, and he sways between these states representative of his internal conflict. Such as in this story, Guts alone at nightfall, it is raining, 
A priest traveling by carriage approaches him, offering shelter and company. Guts tells him no, spirits are chasing him, it's for your own good, you really must not, but the priest insists. He doesn't believe in Guts' story of evil spirits. So Guts eventually decides that he does not care. What happens to this person? A part of me wonders whether Guts' decision here was in part due to spite. You'll see what happens when you don't listen to me, arrogant man. The irony of this story is the priest, by definition someone who believes himself to be wise and knowledgeable of the truths of the world, self-assured enough to teach these things to other people, he does not believe in evil spirits that to us and guts obviously exist within this world. The priest is just the same as the mayor, deluded, living within a comfortable lie that supports his grandiose view of himself and his own self-importance. And it is this ignorance which allows him to make a decision which kills both himself and his daughter. In the real world, there are hundreds of different beliefs, all of which preach that they are the ultimate truth. Yet logically, they cannot all be correct. In this way, most if not all the people of the world are just like this priest, erroneously arrogant and self-confident within their delusion, and capable of cultivating their own death and damnation out of ignorance. In actuality, this priest and his daughter should have instead listened to Guts instead of preaching at him. Is Guts to blame for this? He does not believe so. He tried, they died, it was their fault. That's how he makes himself feel better. He wants to believe this. But the truth is, is even though they may have been ignorant, Guts was the one to kill them. I found this story to be the first that was really painful to read. The only thing that could be enjoyed here, I think, was suffering. Mira played with our emotion. The cool hero's gravitas attracted the priest's daughter. And as a reader, I perhaps hoped that a relationship would build between them. Often when we read stories, we come to expect things like this. It's just another trope. And Mira turned that enjoyable trope into a nightmare. The daughter was the first to die. Her dead body was then possessed by a demon, and Guts was forced to kill her again. I believe that this second death was symbolic because from the very start, Guts was responsible for her death. She was innocent of any wrongdoing. These things clearly weigh on Guts' soul. Events like this have made Guts as he is now. Relationships and compassion are pain in a world this cruel. Guts said earlier, what did he care what happened to them? Guts also lies to himself. He does care. He can't help it, but it is slowly driving him insane. Miura was also symbolic in his description of this. Guts, of course, killed the daughter when she was possessed by a demon, but the daughter gave a little cut to Guts himself. I think that this represents Guts' emotional scar from this event. Just as with the priest and the mayor, Guts also has convenient truths which nurture self-preservation. And through these stories, the nature of this begins to manifest. The strong survive and the weak die is Guts' false justification for the evil that he is a part of, so as to absolve him of moral responsibility and diminish his own suffering. Just like everybody else, Guts has chosen self-preservation above doing what is right. Everybody lives within their own world, and this is Guts's. He should have never traveled with the priest and the daughter, but he wants so desperately to not care for all the people that he cannot save. And I think that Guts may understand his own delusion to some extent. He may not be able to give up and die, but he certainly does not fear death. Perhaps he welcomes it. I don't think that Guts knows of a better solution. He does not have hope. He is burned both ways, fighting for others and fighting alone. This last story centers around another demon, a monster who is called The Count who has assumed the role of a religious tyrant, killing and later devouring those he has labeled heretics. Again, the purpose of this story is slightly different to explain the creation of demons, the group that call themselves apostles, who were introduced earlier with the Snake Lord, and also introduced the God Hand. The great reveal here is that these demons, the apostles, were at one time human before selling their souls to evil. This then directly leads into the larger fight where we learn who Guts' real enemy is and his own past. The story is sort of catered to these reveals, important ones to world build this universe and Guts' destiny within it. We meet a former doctor, Vargas, 
who helps Guts, reveals the history of the Count and expresses his desire for revenge as the Count has killed and eaten his family while Vargas himself was partially eaten alive before he was able to escape. Just before this, Guts encounters and defeats the overconfident arrogant, Zondark, who was the captain of the Count's guards. Zondark, deranged and enraged by this defeat, is then coerced by the Count to become a demon himself, who must also be defeated. We meet the Count's daughter, Theresia, who is innocent of all of this and has been locked inside of her room for years by the Count, which he justifies as a precaution due to his fear that harm would befall her because of heretics, just the same as what occurred to her mother. And through her, we gather a more complete understanding of the Count himself, once perhaps a good man who loved his wife and daughter more than anything in this world. Cruel he might have been, but Theresia saw him as a just man who had to make hard decisions for the protection of his family and people. To some extent, I feel like Mira validated the Count. Dozens, if not hundreds of people in the court were heretics. Even Vargas, the doctor, when we first meet him, it seems possible he does appear to be a heretic with a collection of grotesque items in jars. Even after becoming a demon, it is possible that the Count correctly identified Vargas for what he was. Is the Count's faith right and the heretics wrong? I mean, we don't live in this world, we don't know specifically what they believe, we don't know the absolute truth, we cannot be certain. I would actually assume both of them are wrong, uh, but this isn't to say that they are wrong to the same level. Based on how Mira chose to draw it and the imagery that he chose, I kind of do assume that heretics might worship the devil or worship demons. So from this, it might actually be true that the Count's fight was more just than the heretics. However, the Count, just like most people, believes himself right, believes he is fighting evil and acting on behest of God. So by his own definition, evil pervaded his domain, so his fight was very real. But this is kind of how the Count was before he became a demon. The man who was Theresia's father became inhuman. After a long campaign against heretics, the Count returned home only to find his wife participating in a heretical orgy. Blind with rage, the Count killed all that were there, with the exception of his wife. He could not kill his wife, and it appeared as though she knew this. She almost mocked him. As it was described, killing his wife would be like killing half of himself. So instead, the Count decided to kill himself. I guess the thought is best go all the way. Yet all of this was preordained by the wheel of fate, his despair. The wailing of his soul opened up a portal to another dimension, a feat only possible because of a magical object which is called the Balin, an object which had somehow found its way into his possession. And so in this alternate dimension, the Count met the God Hand, as far as we are aware, the most powerful demons, angels of evil. In most mythologies, there exists the idea that humans are not intrinsically evil, rather they are pushed in that way because of agents of evil manipulating our flaws. I think that this holds true in Berserk. The Count only wished to be released from sorrow and despair, to be saved from his suffering. Through his circumstances and the weakness it created, he only wanted relief, and the God Hand sold that to him. They coerced him. The price was only his wife's life, a wife who did not respect him, a wife who had betrayed him, consorted with evil. It should be an easy decision to make, yet for the Count it still wasn't, but eventually he made it anyway, becoming a demon, becoming an apostle. The irony, I think, is that this man, a very religious man, a religious tyrant, seems to have become that which he fought against for the sake of saving himself. Once again, selfishness. The cynicism of Berserk, people choose themselves over others. But yet even after this decision and after his transformation, he still seems to be deluded. Even as a demon, he still fights against heretics in a way which implies that he still believes in this fight to some degree. Even as a demon, he continues to worry about the safety of his daughter, Theresia, at the hands of heretics. Or maybe he just does not want her to see what he has become. He is a living, breathing, walking contradiction. A man who still somehow fears heretics, despite being the active hand of evil. Justified in some absurd way. As it's sort of described, right, heretics are pagans, so they believe in multiple gods, 
So maybe even still as a demon, the Count believes in one god, even if that god were to be a force of evil. So Guts was able to defeat him, and once again his desire opened the dimension and called the God Hand. Within Berserk, there exists this concept of being ordained by the laws of fate. Fate seems to decide who can become an apostle, and likely it controls everybody's destiny. And the apostles have the ability to call the God Hand to aid them, to grant their desire, whatever that might be, if the desire is strong enough. Initially, the Count wished that the God Hand would kill Guts for revenge, but the God Hand said that they could not do this. His desire is not actually Guts' death. The reason why they were called and the portal opened was his desire for life. Here again, perhaps Miura is arguing that self-preservation is usually, if not always, the strongest motivating force, which I think heavily contrasts with God's. Perhaps this is why he was never fated to become an apostle, despite the fact that the God Hand even acknowledged that he would be a useful servant. But the God Hand tells us that the Count desired life, and they could grant him life if he were to again sacrifice a bit of his own soul, his daughter, Theresia. The God Hand does everything that they can to manipulate him. They turn them against each other so that the Count makes the decision that they want. But the God Hand fails. He does not sacrifice his daughter, and he dies, condemning his soul to an eternity of hell. What I would gather here is that even as a demon, there was humanity left within him. He did not want life at any cost. It appears that the God Hand believes in fate, yet here, Mira demonstrates that fate is not unyielding. The thread of fate can be cut. I would assume this to be important. Willpower versus fate. I surmise many if not all the apostles would be similar in some way. While they believe in their own power and supremacy as demons, that they are above humanity in some important respects they retain their humanity, such as a fear of death or desire for revenge, whatever it might be. So they too are deluded. But this turn of expectation was double-fold. The Count chose death, and then later Theresia chose to blame Guts for all that had happened and all that she had learned. There was actually some pretty cool symbolism here uh, because Theresia was trapped in her room. This is a physical manifestation of a comfortable delusion. Theresia thinks that she wants freedom from this room, but really she does not. She doesn't understand that this delusion, being trapped in this room, being separated from reality, saves her from a fate perhaps worse. She lost her freedoms, but she gained a quality of life that she will never get back when she steps out. Honestly, I expected this after reading the story up until this point. Mira will not allow Guts to make friends, aside from Puck, and, you know, who Guts doesn't really consider to be a friend anyway. But, you know, at least Puck is still alive and following him. Every time the story goes in this direction, where it appears as though Guts could make a friend, but does not, I find myself frustrated and disappointed. But I understand that there is always a lesson about the flaws of being human somewhere within that. Theresia needed somebody to blame. She needed a reason to keep living and survive. And Guts gave her that reason, even as it hurt him to do so. He saved her life by giving her purpose, revenge. She then keeps living with the goal of one day being able to kill Guts, delusion for self-preservation. But at the same time, this appears to be a solution which perpetuates hate. And you can kind of see through Puck that this isn't quite the right move, or it shouldn't be. There's almost this question about whether Guts should have allowed Theresia to die, rather than extended his hand to save her under these circumstances, with this motivation. From this point forward, Theresia could then go on as another force of evil, blackened by the world, likely as she is now. I feel like the answer that Mira is subtly conveying is that the right move was for Guts to work harder, to try to befriend her, to change her, but he just cannot. He instead imparted onto her a will of survival that he is most familiar with. He perhaps in a way doomed her to his own suffering, for the sake of his own survival. We've mostly skipped over Vargas' story, but for seven years he worked tirelessly in pursuit of revenge against the Count. Revenge at any cost. 
The point of this story to me seems to be relatively simple. Guts should have saved him, but he could not. The very same as Theresia. In his place, Puck attempts to, just the same as Theresia. However, he is unable to protect him, Vargas, for long enough for this salvation to truly occur. Vargas needed to put aside his hatred, his desire for revenge, and move on with his life. He almost had a turning point before he died. Ultimately, because Guts fears building relationships, having people that he cares for, he abandoned Vargas in his time of great need. Vargas was weak, Vargas was captured, then he was killed. His soul sent to hell, which later dragged the Count with it. Guts had a moral responsibility once more that he shunned for self-preservation. Yet even in the act, he still witnessed Vargas' death, and it hurt him. To me, it appears as though Guts understands what he needs to do, what his job is. He just cannot do it. So we aren't going to talk too much about this as this leads into the next arc and Guts' past. Griffith is a member of the God Hand who Guts personally knows from his time as a human. Guts witnessed his fall or his rise to demonhood, and the event brought with it great tragedy for Guts himself. What I want to focus on more so is the state of this world. In the story about the priest, he seemed to not know about the existence of evil spirits, as though that, you know, they weren't common. As it appears, this is a world in transition. Demon kind and evil has always existed, but perhaps are becoming even more active and unavoidable than they were previously. If Griffith is a recently created god hand, within Gut's lifetime, I wonder about the others. How old are they? Were they were their previous god hands? Will others be created later? Have they ever been killed before? Was the world saved from them at some point in the distant past? If the god hand are agents of evil, are there agents of good? An actual god? Real angels? These things are not yet explained. But it's one of those things about this introduction to the world of Berserk that keeps me hooked and interested. I think that the scene with the god hand and Griffith does an excellent job of sort of establishing uh, Guts' in-game ambition, sort of the strongest entities within this world, which we assume Guts must someday be able to rival, even as a human. All we really know for now is that these objects, Behelets, exist. How or when they were created, we do not know. What exactly they are, we do not know. But they seem to perpetuate evil in some important way. And this evil is crescendoing, and Guts may be the person destined to beat it back. Or if he is not destined, he may create this fate through his sheer willpower. But I just want to point out this concept. A Guts wants to fight as a human. It almost seems important to him. He almost takes pride in it. He is the human who defeats demons without the aid of demons. But it's foreshadowed here in this these first three volumes that... Guts may be more than that. He may be a demon or have powers that are not human, that he actually has to fight against in order to repress. I'm very curious as to where this goes. It seems, again, important. I wouldn't say that this is the greatest opening act of any manga I've read ever, but I believe it was effective in its goal, to build up a world that nobody wants to be a part of, not even the characters in the story, while exploring themes of delusion and reality, the nature of power, evil, and isolation. If you can make it through this, the next arc is sure to take the story to another level entirely. Mira's goal, I believe, was to set the stage. This is our starting point. From here, things can't get too much worse, at least for now. Not for Guts personally, at any rate. Even as potentially making friends or finding people that he cares for, might make Guts suffer, I believe that this fate, the world that he is walking at this moment, is still worse. At least for me as a reader. But undoubtedly more tragedy is on the way. However, if Guts is unable to form meaningful, lasting relationships that do not end in tragedy, I don't know for how long I can stomach it. Above all else, this is where I need Berserk to go in order to continue enjoying it. As for now, I am simply carried by the expectation that eventually we will get there. I also want to make this clear, the artwork and the storytelling is exceptional. How the story is told is beautiful in a way that cannot be easily described. There is an art to the use of words, to drawings, and Berserk understands this, intermixing effective communication with artistic expression in a way I really admire. 
And to be 100% with you, where we start at the beginning of Berserk, I've read The Golden Age already. We talked about that. It, it only gets better. Berserk is drawn in a way which brings it to life in all respects. Mira is an incredible artist. I think that people kind of would expect me to talk more about this, but I really won't be bringing this up too much again in future videos uh, because it just seems to be a constant and I don't think that I'm the right person to be critiquing art. And you can only say how much you love something was drawn so many times in so many different ways. But anyway, guys, I appreciate how the story was told, how the, the battles were written and drawn. The pacing was great. Reading Berserk in general, I found to be very easy. There was never a point where I felt like putting it down. Never a point where I felt like events dragged on. But yeah, guys, not gonna lie, it'd be really easy for me right now. It's taken a lot of effort just to record this video. I haven't even edited it yet at the time that I'm talking now. But it would be so easy to just continue reading Berserk because, I mean, stopping is not something I'm actually wanting to do. But at the same time, I have a unique opportunity here to experience my journey through reading it that I think that I should be patient for. I'm really excited to see what's to come. But yeah, guys, I'm really thankful for all of you who made it to this part of the video and who are looking forward to me covering the golden age and things to come. If you guys enjoyed this video, I very much would appreciate it if you shared it with other people that you know, who maybe you want to get into Berserk or who already like it. From this point forward, I hope to focus more so on the events and the story and a little bit less on the philosophy, but this felt like the best jumping in point. I wanted to say a lot of things here, so I didn't have to say them later. And it made the video a lot longer than I thought it would be. Now, usually my outro, I'd say I'm curious as to what you guys think, but I'm not going to be reading the comments because I'm just going to expect that the comments are going to spoil me. And I'd rather not be spoiled since the story is there for me to consume and, you know, I'm not waiting weekly. But regardless of that, feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. Like the video if you like the video, dislike the video if you dislike the video, subscribe if you want to be notified for my future content, and as always guys, have a wonderful day.